Okay. So we now going to see a uh, couple of uh, RDD operations, uh, inbuilt operations, pretty simple operations. Uh, and my objective is to kind of give you some uh, idea. Of, uh, I mean, how easy they are, what you can do, and different kinds of stuff that you can do with them. Of course, this is not by uh, any mean the exhaustive list of operations that you have here. You can write your own operations later on. But you just get to know what is the facility that is available compared to like standard MapReduce. Okay, so let's and because we talked about that uh, broadly two types of operations like transformation operation and action operations. So let's try to look into the basic RDD transformation operation. And here I'm dealing with the single RDD. Okay, single RDD operations. So the operations that you're going to perform in a single RDD. There are paired RDDs as well. In the next few slides, we are going to see it. With. Okay. So <clears throat> one operation is probably be uh, you be you will be using now and then is called map operation. So just like the map function that you write in MapReduce. Okay. So map operation you basically apply uh, to each element in the RDD. Okay. It's just one one operation. Okay. For each element in RDD, you apply this operation and return some result. Okay. So here assuming that my RDD is uh, is a basic containing data one two three three. Okay, this is the data that I have in my RDD. And third column, if you see that how am I actually using that kind of operation? So my RDD dot map. Okay, and inside this map parenthesis, the actual code, the map code. Map is a function, and you can write your own code inside it. Okay, so whatever code that you write, like to write. So here, what I'm trying to do, basically, my code is incrementing the values by one. And that's it. Simple. Okay, you can do any other operations in it. So x to x plus one. What does it mean? Is that the x refers to one element of this RDD, and then two means the arrow, and then you are performing something and producing the output, which is x plus one. So you can see the result two three four four. Okay, all right. Now the other operation is flat map. Is a map operation, but it's different from the uh, the other map operation okay so what it does again it basically applies on uh, on each element of this rdd okay but you can produce from one element you can produce multiple elements so one to many kind of thing you can do so map is one to one operation flat map is one to many operation okay so for example rdd dot flat map it takes one element x and then produces x to x dot two three that means one to three Two, three, 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 etc., etc. Okay, because it's just simply taking the number and so x dot two three is a scalar function. Okay, it's a scalar function, nothing to do with MapReduce, uh, nothing to do with Spark. So you can basically use the scalar function inside this one. Okay. Now another operation that we will be frequently using in this is called filter operation. Okay. So again, it basically uh, operated on individual elements, and you apply some kind of filter. So it will basically prune uh, or filter out the data based on the conditions or whatever function that you are writing out. So here you can see that x from x not equals to one. It is basically producing the elements which are not equals to one as an output. Okay. Now distinct is another operation. Okay, it simply removes the duplicate elements. So rd dot distinct is one two three. Okay, you can do also random sampling from RDD. Okay, so you basically uh, do sample with, with replacement, without replacement, depending upon whatever you want to do. So these are some examples of the of the transformation operations that you have. One thing to note is that that it looks very simple here, and this is flexibility that provided by the Spark framework. But internally, all these things are done in a distributed fashion. Okay, so basically the data is sitting into multiple computers, in a cluster of computers, and this, this all things are done basically internally uh, by Spark in a distributed fashion. Okay, now we have seen some examples of the action uh, transformation operations. Now we're going to see some examples of the action operations. Okay, so again let's consider this RDD containing one, two, three, three. Okay, so 
Uh, one thing that I wanted to point out is that you should not confuse the fact that the variable name need not be RDD. Okay, it could be any variable name. I'm just using RDD here for convenience. That's it. But you can put any variable name that you like. The normal way that you write in any program. So function is collect. Okay, what it does? It basically returns all elements from the RDD. So there's an RDD which is kind of distributed across multiple machines. Okay, so when you do RD dot collect, it will return all elements together to you uh, as a kind of singularity. Similarly, count operation, you know, this number of elements that you have in the RDD. Uh, now, the another important operation which you'll probably be using now and then, okay, is the top operation. So top basically returns the top two elements, okay, of an RDD. Okay, when you are doing like this uh, kind of heap operations, so typically do on some piece of data, you generally do kind of the top few elements you want to return. So top operation is basically doing that. Okay, then count by value. So basically telling you the number of times each element occurs in the RDD. Okay, so as you can see that one appearing once, two appearing once, three appearing twice, and so on and so forth. But the final operation, which is probably the most important of all these operations, is called reduce operation. So what this reduce operation will do, it basically reduce these values to produce only one value. Okay, so you essentially combine operation that you do. So combine the elements of the RDD together in parallel. And the structure of this operation is, you have to be a little more careful of the structure of this operation. So what is that? Now, if you look at this carefully, reduce operation is basically takes two elements and produces one element okay, at a time. And then you basically are going to use this thing. Since in a sense, this is the associative operation. Okay? So it takes two elements, x comma y, and say in this case, I will, I'm going to produce x plus y. So if you have to sum a set of elements, so this is the way basically you can do it. Now, we talked about single RDD operations. Okay, now you have to deal with two RDDs often. Like there are many things like join, set intersection, set union, subtraction, all kinds of stuff which will require operations on two RDDs. Okay, so here you have that kind of operations also. So again, let's see the transformation operations on two RDDs. Now, in our case, the two RDDs are basically one containing one, two, three, and the other is three, four, five. Okay, so union of two RDDs is basically RDD, one RDD dot union, the other RDD, okay, other is basically RDD, and you are going to see the union of all these things. In a similar fashion, you can get the intersection, subtraction, Cartesian product, and all kinds of set operations that you can do because they involve pairs of RDD to do that. Okay, so one RDD dot the operation name and within that you have the other RDD and you are going to get the results. Okay, now paired RDDs, another perhaps the most important uh, data structure that we'll be playing with often. So this is the sort of this, uh, the main concept behind the MapReduce framework and you have the same kind of things here as well. Okay, so far we have seen the RDDs which are the paired single element things, okay. The single elements and all. So in pair data it is, so you have this structure into key and value pairs. The so sum key and then the value. Okay. So which is the fundamental concept for MapReduce model. Now, in this case, assuming that my RDD has these three elements. So one, two, three, four, and three, six. So each of these elements will have two parts. The first part is the key, and the second part is the value. Okay. Now, one of the most important function that we perform is called reduce by key. Okay, reduce by key is the operation name. And inside it, the function, that function that you want to perform on it, reduce can be of, for many reasons. You want to simply want to count the values, you want to sum, many other things that you could do, right? So depending on the function that you want. So you essentially you want to combine the values with the same key, depending upon the function that you want to write. So in this case, if you look at the example, third column, so our DD dot reduce by key, x comma y to x plus y. So what I am doing here, reduce by key is basically summing the values together. Okay, so reduce by key by default will perform this operation based on the keys, common keys. You don't have to specify which, I mean, the key information here. Okay. 
The other operation you will probably be using now and then is called group by key, which is different from reduce by key. Okay, so group by key is basically it doesn't perform any specific operation on it like reduce by key, but you simply want to group the elements for the same key. So for every key, it will basically group all the values associated with it and basically produces sort of kind of an array. Okay, that's the difference between reduce by key and group by key. And then you basically want to perform any kind of operation, you can do it. Um, so map values you can do essentially like you want to operate something on the values field okay, of the RDD. So you can use the map values function. You want to change the values of the RDDs only. So you can basically do that and you're going to do that. Okay. Keys again, keys returns all the keys in your RDD. Similarly, values returns all the values in your RDD. Short by key is basically does the whole thing, produces the output uh, <clears throat> by shorting the data based on the uh, key value and so on and so forth. And there are many such functions. These are some of the widely used functions that I'm showing you. But if you like this, you know, uh, take a look at the book that I recommended, you are going to see lots of functions. And it is actually evolving. So there are, now it is third version of Spark is available. So the things are basically evolving. So you can basically take a look at the website. OK. Now, some of the action operations for paired RDD. OK, so it's like count by key, which is counting these, uh, these, these values Okay, based on every key and so on. OK, the other important thing is the lookup. OK, so RDD is basically is nothing but you can think about a distributed kind of you know array. OK sitting actual multiple machine. And so because it's a paired RDD, so there's one key element that could be value element. So if you want to figure out the value for a particular key, you want to figure out, for example, that what is the frequency of say words, say IID, something like this. So you can do lookup kind of thing, lookup table, just like the hash operations that you do, map operations you do. So you do lookup into key, and then it is going to basically produce you the values corresponding to that particular key. Okay. So pretty simple, you just maybe you want to play with this kind of small stuff to make sure that you basically understand the basic functions. OK. Just like the uh, uh, the standard RDD with single element, you can also uh, have the paired RDDs for uh, 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 the, the uh, two paired RDDs. You can do some kind of operation. So when you are doing these things, paired RDDs, so one of the things that probably will encounter is the join operation. OK, so it's just like two table joins and things like this, and which is pretty handy. OK, one of the very widely used function in a big data is basically join operations. OK. So you have one RDD with key and value. You have another RDD with key and value. And then you simply perform join operation on these things. And join will be done by the common key. OK, and that is how basically do it. OK, you also have the co-group co operations now. OK, now we talked about how to create RDDs from this. We talked about transformation functions for RDDs. We talked about action operations RDDs. OK. The one important thing that Spark supports is called RDD persistence. OK, something that is very important for processing large volume of data and which in particular when you are doing repeated computation on a speech of piece of data, something which I mentioned the in-memory data processing. OK. And this one of the thing that which is basically makes it makes it different from the standard map reduce. Okay, and which is called RDD persistence. So how do we persist RDD? Control the kind of you know how we can put these things into memory or disk depending upon whatever we have. Okay, and how we can basically process it. Okay. So the fundamental thing is that that Spark can persist or even I call it caching. So you can cache a data set in memory across operations. OK, so what it does basically. In each node of the cluster. OK. You have a, some slice of data in that. And you are putting that you can put that slice of data into memory of that particular node. OK, so that whenever you have to reuse it, you can quickly reuse it. OK, as opposed to the other option, of course, you want to keep that whole 
something is in the hard disk, which is basically very slow if we have to repeatedly use this data. OK. And also this is fault tolerant in the sense that if your machine number one holding some piece of data into memory, your Spark code knows how it was actually created from beginning. So it has a lineage graph structure, dependency graph structure. So if anything goes wrong, <coughs> you can quickly go and recover that particular piece of data right from scratch. So here is this actual thing as a programmer that you probably want to care about. So the goal is to keep RDD in memory. OK, main memory and it distributed across machines. OK, and of course, which I repeatedly telling you is that the primary objective of this is that for iterated computation, you want to increase the efficiency, a piece of data which will be required multiple times during your computation. Instead of keeping that into hard disk, you want to keep that in memory. But of course, depending upon the volume of the data and the capacity of your cluster, for example, main memory is very expensive compared to hard disk. You may not have that flexibility to put all the data into main memory. So what do we do then? Fortunately, Spark gives you lots of flexibilities. OK, and storage levels. So if you look, take a look at it one by one. So first is called memory only. So you create an RDD and then you say memory only. So it will basically store the entire RDD in distributed memory. OK. Now the second storage level is called memory and disk. So it is required when you know that you do not have enough memory in your cluster. OK, to hold all the data. So you simply say memory and disk. So what Spark will automatically look, it will try to optimize for you. You don't have to worry about it. So it will try to keep the data in memory as much as possible and the remaining data it will keep into disk. OK, memory only serialized Java objects. Serialized means that you simply convert the Java objects into byte streams. OK, for easy communications. OK. So you can also do memory only serialized, so the raw data will be serialized and then it will try to keep into main memory. Similarly, memory and disk serialized, OK, and so on. You can also do disk only in case you do not need something. OK, you can tell that, OK, I want to keep this in a disk only. OK, so it basically stored the whole data in disk only. And more interestingly, just like the data replication in HDFS, you can also replicate in memory data as well. So the last row of this table tells you that. If you say the memory only two, it means the data will be replicated twice in memory. Or if you say memory and disk two, the data will be replicated in memory and disk twice, depending upon the capacity of memory and disk. So the data replication is also possible in main memory as well, not only in hard disk. So that again enhances flexibility and fault tolerance. OK, so these are different kinds of storage level available to uh, in Spark. Now the operation when you write it is very simple. You basically have your RDD. You create an RDD and RDD that you that RDD dot say one particular storage level that you have here. It could be memory only, memory and disk, memory only serialized and so on. But just one line of code and then Spark will do everything for you. OK. All right. Now here is this kind of, you know, uh, uh, little example of this thing. So one op option of this is so you have seen it all kinds of stuff. One option of this is doing, for example, here you can see that the first line again I'm reading from the readme.md file text file. The second line is the extreme end. OK, what you can see this operation called cache. OK, so in case I missed out this particular explanation, what happens is that if dot some operation dot map dot cache. So basically you are performing flat map operation on if previous RDD. Then you are feeding the data to another operation called map, then map operation to cache. So dot 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 dot. It means that the sequence of operations and you are basically feeding the output of one operation to the next one. So that's the normal way of achieving this thing, Scala, dot, 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 and so on and so forth. So 
extreme end of the second line of Scala code, you see I am using the cache thing. So this is in other way of telling that I want to keep the entire thing into memory. So just equivalent to the memory only uh, storage level. Okay, rather than using memory only, you can use simply cache. Okay. All right. Now, one important thing in parallel programming is that how you can control the parallelism. Okay, so depending upon the resources and all, how you can control parallelism. So if you already do not have enough number of partitions, okay, for example, your RDD has only two partition, okay, you cannot run four executors on it because one partition will be executed by one executor. Okay, so it's basically a wastage of your resources. Okay, so then basically how you can control your parallelism. Okay, it depends on like how you are basically partitioning your RDD. Okay, and here now we are going to see how we can basically play with that kind of stuff. So the objective, of course, is to control how this data will be physically distributed across the cluster. Okay, you can reduce the number of partitions, you can increase the number of partitions, both depending upon your requirement, and both is possible in Spark, uh, this partitioning controlling mechanism. So the first thing is called coalesce. So what it does, it collapses the partitions on the same worker. Say in a same worker, you have for some reason you created three, four partitions or during your intermediate processing of data, there are say, three, four partitions were created. And probably you have noticed that, okay, I want to next in the next phase, I have to run a single worker on it. So I don't need all these partitions. So what you do, you can basically say, I want to simply coalesce it by one. So the entire thing, if there are multiple partitions, okay, it will be collapsed to only one partition. It, okay. So, so this word is, is basically here my RDD, the original RDD I'm using, just an example. It could be any RDD that you have, and then coalesce, and then one, basically telling that how many basically partition you want to do it. It can be any number, or it can be two, three, or whatever, whatever. Second, of course, increasing, repartitioning this data. Why repartitioning? Now, as I have mentioned, repartitioning can enhance your parallelism. Okay, so if you not do that, okay, I now have many resources. I have to run many th threads or many uh, like you know workers. So I want to repartition this data into smaller chunks. Okay, and then basically apply these operations. Okay, but be very careful about it when you are repartitioning these things. Okay it may shuffle the data across nodes. Okay, that is one hitch that probably you have to keep in mind. Okay, and of course, increasing this number of partitions can increase the level of parallelism. So simple way to achieve these things is words dot repartition and these numbers, the whatever repartitions that you want to create. So RDD dot repartition and a number. Okay, now by default, of course, this uh, Spark has inbuilt partitioners. Okay, so it has two kinds of partitioners, inbuilt partitioners. Okay, so hash partitioner and range partitioner. So hash partitioner, hash partitioner is for the discrete values. Okay, when you have discrete valued elements, then you use hash partitioner, and the range partitioner is for continuous valued elements because in that case hash is going to be very difficult. You cannot do that. So like you basically have to do range partitioner. Okay, so for example, when your key is word, for instance, and you want to partition your RDD based on that, then you have to use hash partitioner. You cannot use range partitioner. When, for example, the key is, say, for example, blood pressure or something like that, okay, then you have want to use the range partitioner, okay, for continuous values and so on and so forth. So in within one range, in one partition, the next range, another partition, and so on and so forth. Okay, so these are inbuilt partitioner when you do partitioning based on these previous operations. Now, again, Spark is a very flexible system and it gives you lots of control. So as a programmer, you understand partitioning is one of the important thing to achieve parallelism. So you can actually write your own custom partitioner depending upon the data. If you have some knowledge about data, you want to control your partitioning a little better way than the uh, inbuilt partitioners, then you can also do that things. Okay. 
So the objective, of course, to you have better control on this data, and you probably want to avoid shuffles depending upon that. So as a programmer, you are in a better position to do that rather than a blind inbuilt functions available on Spark. So you can do that. Okay. So objective, of course, is to you want to even out the distribution of your data across class clusters okay, when you have very skewed data. Okay. Make sure that you know all the workers get roughly the same amount of data. Okay. And so you want to do that. So the way to do it is that, and again, this is a small Scala example. So you simply uh, 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 import this thing, import uh, ORG Apache Spark dot partition. There's a partitioner class, so you can do that. And then all you have to do, you have to basically extend the partitioner class a little bit, so because you are writing your own partitioner. So you give name of your own partitioner, say domain partitioner, my partitioner, whatever. And it extends this original partitioner class because they already have that. Okay, and you write your own partition function inside this body. And in the last line of code, so it's like my RDD dot partition by is the keyword. Okay, my RDD dot partition by is the keyword. And then within this, you basically create your own partitioner, which you have defined. So new domain partitioner. Okay, and so it will basically partition your data based on the function that you have defined for yourself. Now, another important thing is that distributed shared variables. Okay. Now, in cluster computing, one of the things that we talked about is that you have to minimize data communication between workers while they are in progress. Okay. So, if you have too much of communication of data between different workers, then you will be in trouble. But then that takes away some flexibility from you. If you cannot share some data across workers, you may have to use some shared variables now and then. Okay, so that's problematic. Okay, so that takes a lot of flexibility. So fortunately, Spark has uh, that little flexibility for you. So these things called the distributed shared variables. Okay, and let's look into it. So there are two things in it. One calls broad cost variables and the second thing is called accumulators. OK. So let's look at the broadcast variables first. The broadcast variables something. So if you look at the, the spark kind of in the program, so when you write a program, then what happens? There's a driver which is driving all your codes and there are a bunch of executors which will be run on individual nodes on the clusters. OK, and this is how basically the data flow will go on and so on and so forth. Now, the broadcast variable, it gives you the flexibility to keep read-only variable. So broadcast variables are read-only variable. You cannot change it. Okay. So for example, that I have to send some amount of data to all the workers while they will be processing. There can be a situation like that. Okay. So what you do then in this in broadcast variable? So this part once you declare a particular variable, broadcast variable. Then Spark will basically send the same copy of data to all the workers once. Okay. And all the workers will basically cache this data into their own memory. Okay. So you don't have to repeat it again and again. You don't have to uh, recommunicate this data into different machines while the computation is going on. Okay. So you do it once. And Fortunately, Spark uses a very efficient distributed mechanism to kind of broadcast this variable to reduce communications. So here is an example, okay, little example that probably give you a better idea. So say my uh, data that I have, say for example, Spark the definitive guide, big data processing made simple. So this is a little piece of data that I have, for example. Okay, so I created one variable called data, and then I want to apply split operation on it. So my collection is data dot split. So it will basically split the whole data into words. Okay, it's into the group list now. Kind of tokenized based on the <coughs> blank spaces. And then Spark context will parallelize my collection twice. Okay, so this data that I created, it will basically parallelize this whole thing twice uh, to create two copies of data into different workers. Okay, this is data creation, but you can use any other things. Okay. All right, but the most important thing here is the supplementary data. For example, that for every word in my vocabulary, 
I have some associated ID or something, some information that I want to also make use of. OK, so how do I do that? Every worker will need that piece of data. OK, it's a like table. OK, some ID, for example, I want to create. For, for example, I want to pass for every word the integer ID. OK, so every worker will need that because every worker may encounter that particular word. So you need to know that. So what we can do then basically, I say that I create a supplemental data, which is basically a map. OK, map means not the map function of map. This is a map data structure map. So map of word to some kind of ID or some number or something like this. So I create that one. OK, and I need to send this across, send this to all these workers in my uh, in my cluster. OK, so that they can make use of it. So this is the way to do it. So now basically I have to broadcast this data to all these things. So the way to do it is basically the sub broadcast the variable that you want to create is equals to spark context dot broadcast. That is a keyword. OK, and then the data that you want to broadcast supplemental data. And it will basically broadcast the entire data to all these worker nodes in your cluster. OK, and therefore the supplemental data, this table actually, this map table that you see here is available to all the workers. So you can very easily take that and kind of do some kind of processing. So you want to know some the value of the broadcast variables, you simply do broadcast variable dot value. Okay, some broadcast variable that you created and just put dot value and it will basically print all the values for you. What are the values and so on and so forth. Okay, just to check that you know things are right. Okay. Now the broadcast variable I mentioned they are read only. Okay, you something that you don't want to change it. Once you create it, you send it to them and then you you never change it. But in some situations, you may need shared variables which need to which you need to alter. Say counters, for example. OK, say for example, the sums of a particular field, some variable and all. OK, so how to do that? In that case, the read only things are not going to work. You need to have the flexibility to modify it. OK, so fortunately Spark supports another variable called accumulator variables, okay? which you can accumulate data from multiple different nodes and it's actually changeable. You can change it. OK, so here is a little example of accumulator variables. Say so you declare accum, OK, is equals to sc dot accumulator and you initialize this value with zero. So you are going to have the accumulator value to zero. And then you can basically modify this thing. So it is a little example of parallelization using say there are four elements, one, two, three, four. And then you are basically going to increase that value. Now take the sum of all the values into X and then simply print it out. OK, so as you can see that you can basically change and play with all these things. OK. Right. Now. The final thing that today I'm going to briefly touch upon uh, the stream processing and we will have a dedicated lecture on stream processing with the actual codes and stuff, but I just simply wanted to give you a overview of stream processing in Spark. OK. Because stream processing has its own challenges. It is not like the passive data that once you have the data, you can do processing. Stream processing has this. This data has a velocity. It is coming in, and so timely inference from data is very very important. Okay, so it basically poses additional challenges. So let's try to look into Spark streaming architecture. Okay, how it handles it. Okay, so. The first thing is that the stream is basically the records which are coming in continuously. OK, think about the Twitter stream actually. OK, continuously you are getting posts every minute. There are millions and millions of posts coming in. OK, so if you have to implement something for Twitter, how you do it? So there is a thing called stream receiver. It's a dedicated server or it may be a bunch of servers actually. So they are actually receiving these records. OK. Now then, these things will be converted into mini batches, okay? Mini batches of say uh, few records, okay? Or maybe uh, the batches of uh, tweets or batches of streams uh, in every say two seconds, five seconds, and so on and so forth. So you create all the batches, okay? And then once you create these individual batches, which is basically the new RDDs. Then you can send this each of these things to different worker nodes. Okay, 
to parallel process this whole thing. Okay, so you would discretize these streams, okay, and then create mini batches and then send it to individual workers each of this batch and you simply process it. Okay, so the way it does is that you simply chop up the live stream into batches of t seconds. So first t seconds you create one batch, next t seconds you create another batch and so on and so forth. Okay. So you simply receive whatever that you are receiving and these things. Then you treat e this each batch as RDDs, individual RDDs. So just like the way that you process the RDDs, you create the RDDs and process them using the RDD operations. Okay, because the, the main the main challenge here is basically the creating these batches from the stream stream data. Okay, and this is called discretized stream processing in Spark. Okay. Now one of the thing that you have to be careful about that dynamic load balancing. Okay, so as I have mentioned that stream processing is different from passive data processing where you have the entire data into your hard disk and then you simply process it okay because you do not have uh, the uh, the risk of losing this data in that case but here the stream has a velocity is constantly coming in so the timely processing and quickly processing of data is very very important okay so there the, you need to have the dynamic load balancing and why this is required so you divide the data into small micro batches okay so that if something goes wrong okay you can basically reschedule this task here and there so if you do that do uh, do, uh, do kind of micro batch micro batching things fine grain micro batching things then for every worker you can basically assign small amount of work and to make sure that every worker is kind of going to get roughly the same amount of work okay so the smaller the batch size better your load balancing thing okay because your streaming is constantly coming into it okay so you have to be careful about that and whenever a particular resource is available for example if you look at this particular picture the receiver is receiving the whole things and then creating the micro batches and all so two workers are already full okay they do not have enough space to do that so you can see that the third the first worker has some free slot so he immediately assign a small piece of job to this particular worker okay so they maintain a queue okay the load queue which will tell you the workers maintain load queue which will tell you that which worker is free which are completely occupied and so on and basically then you can send the data to the appropriate worker So just like the other cases, failure again is again common place in a stream uh, uh, servers as well. So what you do basically, say for example that a particular node say failed. Okay. So what will then happen? Then because you have mini micro batches, small micro batches, so you can take out that particular piece of work. Okay, and then distribute this to all other nodes. Okay, and relaunch the computation for those particular chunks again. So this again helps you faster recovery due to node failure. Okay, so that is how basically more or less the Spark streaming is typically handled, and we will have a dedicated lecture on Spark streaming where you actually get to know the all functions in Spark that you can basically use to write code for streaming data and all. Okay. So I end up by uh, uh, showing small example. You may not fully understand this example because there are some functions which I have not talked about yet, but then still you probably find something useful in it and we will talk about that later on. So say, um, so one of the examples is basically say I want to join a stream with a pre-computed static data. So I have a static data already available in my hard disk. And I want to join this data with a stream, data stream that I basically I'm receiving. Okay. So the first line of code that you can see, I'm creating data from the Hadoop file, which is my static data. I have basically stored my static data in some uh, my hard disk in a kind of Hadoop file. I'm using Hadoop cluster. So that basically I read. So Spark context.hadoop file file, it will read 
the data from Hadoop file and then create a RDD data set. Now I need to join this data with the stream. So here, you know, Kafka D stream is a kind of stream. Again, it's some inbuilt function, okay, that you can make use of. Kafka D stream dot transform, then basically batch RDD to batch RDD join, data set, filter, etc., etc., whatever that you can do. So very basically very simple that you use Kafka D stream transformation function, you join with your appropriate data set, the previous data set using join operation, and then you like to perform any kind of operation that you like. Okay, so here I'm joining followed by I'm doing some kind of filtering and you can do other kind of operation. Around. So Kafka D stream we will talk about later on how we can basically do these things. But the main purpose of this is that I'm telling you that that you can actually join a stream with a static data okay, in Spark framework very, very easily. Okay. The second example, of course, you want to apply machine learning models all the time on streaming data or any kind of data rather. So say you have an offline model which you already learned. Let's say you want to do clustering. So you have a k-means clustering on some training data set and you have the model ready with you. Now, whenever you are handling the streaming data, say Twitter stream, okay, the tweets are coming in. So you want to quickly figure out that a particular tweet in which cluster it belongs. Okay, and you already have say large tweet clustering data, which you have basically pre-computed, you stored in your file somewhere, somewhere, which is basically model in my case. Okay, so what you do again, you have to apply this model online on the stream. So again, use Kafka stream. So <coughs> you first create Kafka D stream, and then basically you use this you know, thing to kind of predict the whole things, you know, feature IS event, whatever function that you want to write. Okay. So at this stage, this may not be fully realizable, all these functions you get to know when I talk about this, these things, but my basic purpose for this particular slide is to tell you that, that what kinds of operations that you can actually perform the stream data, and you can combine this whole thing with static data that you have in your hard disk. Okay. So yeah, so that's it from my side. Uh, any any question? Anything from you? Sir, why why did we needed the distributed shared variable? Can you explain again? Okay, sure. Okay, so say think about say for example, um, uh, one situation. Think about it. Say that. I basically have to uh, say I, I have to basically print say IDs, okay, the integer IDs of the individual words, for instance. So I already created an IDs, okay. I have a big dictionary where I have the word and the ID, okay. And what I really want to produce, I want to produce uh, the IDs of the individual word that I'm processing it, okay. So already pre-computed dictionary that you have. Now, when the individual workers are processing this data, all the words for, for example, word counting and stuff like that, okay, you also want to know the IDs of it. Okay, so how do you basically do that? So one way to do it, because you have a pre-computed dictionary that you are basically maintaining, you simply send this dictionary to all the workers so that all the workers know for this word, this is the corresponding ID. Unless you know that, okay, you cannot get the ID. Yes, sir. And again, the other uh, th this is for the broadcast variables and for the accumulator variables, for example, you may need to sum. Okay, for example, the simple thing is, say you want to know that how many total number of records each of these workers are actually producing, something like this. Okay, so for that, what you need to know, you need to know the number of records processed by each of these workers. So you need data from each of these workers and then sum them up. Okay, so if you know, uh, need to know that, then basically there is only one variable which is sum will be shared by all the workers and you need to sum them up together. So in that case, you need to have the accumulator variable for that. Okay, sir. thank you. Sir. Okay. Okay. All right, so then yeah, okay, thanks. So see you tomorrow.